Warning, seeing as this is surely to be our spiciest flame-inducing dumpster fire, allow us to state a few things to save you some finger muscles before you are inevitably overcome with the urge to call out our CIA-riddled propaganda. There is no, and I mean no, comparing the modern imperialist history of the United States of America and the newly developing ambitions of China. The U.S. has between 600 and 800 global military bases, and China has three to four. The U.S. spends more on its military than the next seven nations combined. The U.S. has invaded, intervened, exploited, propped up dictators, assassinated leaders, given material aid to the enemies of, and generally fucked up the following countries and growing. We not only acknowledge that they use false pretenses to justify wars such as the Saddam Hussein incubator scandal or yellow cake uranium, therefore WMDs, we are also aware that the material conditions necessary for black liberation movements came at the provision of the Soviet Union and that China as a country is forgiving way more debt than any Western nation ever has in the continent of Africa in exchange for developing manufacturing factories in their countries. Finally, the Trump administration and many before it have used xenophobia and fear-mongering as a way to justify actions against China and things such as suggesting they created the COVID virus or that the government is harvesting the organs of the poor or Alex Jones' level of racist malarkey. Oh, and Adrian Zenz is absolutely a right-wing nutjob not worth using as a source for anything and for more nuanced explorations of the history of the Uyghur people, we'd recommend reading Professor of Anthropology Drew C. Gladney and Justin John Ruddleson. Tankies. While historically the expression referred to members of the Communist Party of Great Britain that follow the USSR line, it has also evolved more recently to be a slang for leftists who either defend Stalinism or support authoritarian or militaristic regimes. The term gained widespread usage to describe those who supported Khrushchev's sending of tanks into Hungary. It's a complicated topic because the term is used and reappropriated by many different groups. There are liberals who refer to tankies as any leftist I don't like. There are Marxist-Leninists who refer to themselves as tankies as a badge of honor to reappropriate it from those people who would use it as an insult. There are people who support historic revolutions, such as the movement of Thomas Sankara, and call themselves tankies. There are white Maoists who call themselves tankies. Except for conservatives. Conservatives just think everyone who isn't Trump is a communist. Biden quoted Mao. He, he thought he was quoting, quote, an old Chinese proverb. And, and the proverb is this. Biden said... According to news reports, women hold up half the sky. So it's an old Chinese proverb. It's not that old. It's a, a saying of Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong said this because he wanted to make the argument that women were an important labor resource and women needed to leave the home and shouldn't be homemakers anymore. While some Black Panthers, such as Fred Hampton, described themselves as Marxist-Leninists, the term tanky hadn't gained widespread usage in the United States at that time. So not all tankies are the same, and it doesn't mean the same thing to call any one person a tanky. In fact, that's why it's a little bit nebulous, and this discussion is a really difficult one to have. The term is both a pejorative and a badge of honor, and means different things to different people depending on whom is saying it to whom. Now, if the idea about exploring extremely insular online drama with memes so meta that they collapse into themselves like a neutron star of why the hell are we talking about any of this uh, seems like a waste of your time, then we recommend skipping to this point in the video where we will most likely please you more by explaining things like why Westerners have no business telling African countries who should be allowed to invest in the region. On April 7th, 2020, we got our first of many callouts from Isha of the Historically Podcast. We were accused of the sin of omission, meaning that because we hadn't called out a certain behavior, it must imply we condone it. While it's fair news to apply a critical eye to our catalog, seeing as it's mostly taking on right-wing reactionaries to challenge white supremacy, colonization, systemic and historical inequities, it's a lot of low-tier trash. That's why we refer to our collective work as a dumpster fire. Nonetheless, we apparently had made a few waves because shortly thereafter began our series of back and forth with Jason and Hua. Wouldn't. Because one of us would kick your fucking head in in a debate. Because you're a pussy who's shooting his mouth off like an angry little child with no substance and not even having the, the bottom basic balls to back up what he says. Then came our first series of encounters with the now infamous Caleb Maupin. Hmm. Burger King. Unlike everyone else in this list, our obsession with Caleb superseded any amount of online attacks he was directing towards us. A lot of gay men's first sexual experience was with a pedophile. And mm. so there were a lot of gay men. 
So naturally we did the only mature thing one can do and we continued to feed into the spectacle and respond to every single one of our accusers with even more inflammatory statements. Soon we were being accused of being imperialists, CIA spies, Cointel Pro, Ukrainian Nazis, or the worst accusation of all, liberals. So after a month, we did the most mature thing possible. We released a video containing various clips and quotes from a collection of individuals who had been butting heads with us and other leftists for some time. Leftists who defend authoritarian regimes and downplay the atrocities of non-Western figures because they're correct in stating that it upholds the current hegemonic control of the United States, and completely incorrect that one should quantify atrocities based on human suffering or that a regime can't be authoritarian and cruel because we prefer a particular leader. While our goal is to turn a series of clips and quotes into a surreal montage that told a narrative, it also clouded what should have been our purpose. While we take umbrage with all three of them individually, lumping them together even while using their own quotes is not a good faith, intellectually honest way to tackle complex issues. It's not fair to lump Jason's transphobia in with Caleb's satanic cabal of bankers any more than it is to display a mix of bad tweets by Aisha misgendering an activist mixed in with jokes that we found to be in poor taste when our intent was to call out her denial of Stalin having any culpability in the Holodomor or the cultural genocide currently taking place to the Uyghur people. Our goal is to point out that Caleb's coded anti-Semitism and Jason's long history of transphobia and doing all three simultaneously without separating them was in poor form. For that, we sincerely apologize, and it's the reason this video will focus entirely on their own individual arguments. We have never stated that all tankies are white. This is a straw Stalin. We never implied all communists were white. We referenced online white tankies as a joke, and you ran with it conflating tankies with actual historical members of various political parties. We don't consider you an actual member of the Communist Party of China, any more than we consider Mao a tanky. The term originated after the creation of the USSR, and you're reappropriating its use and not addressing our particular usage of the word. Secondly, after spending nearly 11 minutes in a video looking possessed because you're asked to take a stance on the transgender issue is beyond parody. Yes, not taking a stand on something as polarizing and vital as standing up for trans rights is itself a stance, and not one that helps the trans community. Still a question of trying to figure fully out what it means to be trans i think there's still a public debate that needs to be that needs to be taken place and two cis dudes shouldn't be the ones to explain that to you so we've included a bunch of links to fantastic trans content creators in the description you still run an article on your website about how the communist party of the usa treasury may have been pillaged by someone who identifies as transgender it was at this point that certain things were discovered. It was found that the entire treasury, which again amounted to $8,000 of everyone's collective dues and money, had been emptied out for sex orgies, were straight party members who attempted to be pressured into unwanted sexual acts. When they refused, they were set upon by certain individuals who identified themselves as transgender." End quote. Unlike the narrative being told online, we have been on the defensive of every single interaction we've had with Isha online. And it's really troubling because we like two of the videos she made on Means TV. And the attacks haven't been in good faith, including guilt by omission, moving the goalpost, whataboutism, moving the goalpost, whataboutism, appealing to authority while simultaneously citing yourself as a source, putting the burden of proof on the person you're accusing, begging the question, whataboutism, and then when all else fails, now let us start by saying the US government has no place feigning outrage at separating children from their parents and putting them in prisons. It has the largest prison population on the planet. Neither does Canada for that matter. In fact, Canadian imperialism is a perfect comparison because it takes place within its own borders where the colonial government of Canada imposes its federal police on sovereign indigenous land and is also involved in systemic eugenics programs. So yes, we're quite aware of how this can take shape in other countries. Right-wing Republicans are also feigning outrage at this particular side of the world because it helps further their own political xenophobic goals against China. Their pearl-clutching crocodile tears for the suffrage of Muslim minorities extends only as far as their imperial ambitions do. We completely agree that Adrian Zenz is a far-right bias source who way too much of the mainstream media chooses to cite, but he's far from the only author on the subject. And beyond the photos, the footage, the worldwide coverage dating back a long time, way before it was politically advantageous, there's still the endless story after story from survivors and refugees. Um, 
Finally, when it comes to the Holodomor famine, we should start at the beginning. There is not a widespread academic debate as to whether or not the famine itself occurred or whether or not the policies of Stalin's government had any culpability. One that was the largest in my head is the quote unquote Holodomor. You know, the, mm -hmm. the um, yeah. blaming Stalin for um, mm -hmm. the famines in Ukraine. I was wondering, if you, yeah. could you get into that, that a little bit? And I guess by starting off with just um, sure. how often pre USSR Ukraine had famines in the first place? Well, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. It was part of Russia before that. Now, there's some good evidence that you know, the western part of Russia, let's say, which includes Ukraine and uh, areas, uh, had famines uh, every few years, uh, more or less forever, more or less, certainly since the, since the Middle Ages, certainly since the 8th or 9th century A.D. It regularly occurred just because of the geographical situation. In the north, it's drier, but there have been famines due to natural causes diseases of plants, uh, plagues of uh, insects, and rats, and droughts, and flooding, uh, cold, very cold weather, such, such a lot of cold weather, they have a mature growing season. So there have been natural famines due to natural conditions for uh, well over a thousand years. And it Grover Fur is a debunked pseudo-historian who denied the Soviet invasion of Poland and claims the Ukraine famine was the result of natural causes and nothing else. In the Khrushchev book, Khrushchev Live, I say in the book, I can show that Khrushchev lied, but in most of these cases I can't say what really happened. Because I, I haven't, either don't know the, the materials or I didn't do the research to find out what really happened. Um, I can just prove that what Khrushchev said you know, was false. A man with extremely problematic links and endorsements on his website. There is an academic debate as to whether it was a selective attempt by Stalin to ethnically cleanse Ukrainian nationals, which would constitute a genocide. The UN definition of genocide does not include ethnic cleansing that occurs regardless of intent, which is something else highly debated. One of the most frequently cited sources by Grover Fur and yourself is the 1932 Harvest and the Famine of 1933 by Mark B. Togger. In fact, Grover calls him the world authority on the famine. It gets a bit weird when you discover what Togger has said about other man-made famines in history, such as the British not being culpable for the potato famine in Ireland, or even more shocking is the British government not being responsible for the famine in Bengal. This man-made famine argument, however, rests on uncritical acceptance of one set of unreliable statistical data that Sen and others have incorrectly described as production data. As will be shown below, scholars who presented this view of the famine had clear evidence that discredited these data, but they did not acknowledge this conflicting evidence, let alone address its implications. And even in his widely cited essay, he still blames Stalin's regime. It's the conclusion, quote, Although the low 1932 harvest may have been a mitigating circumstance, the regime was still responsible for the deprivation and suffering of the Soviet population in the early 1930s. The famine was real, the results of failure of economic policy of the revolution from above, rather of a successful nationality policy against Ukrainians or other ethnic groups. It's undeniable that it's extremely hard to conclusively determine what happened in that period, especially from an American or British perspective, because of the amount of Red Scare McCarthyism that went on during the latter half of the century. Even with that being the case, every single major scholar cited by yourself or Fur, including Michael Ellman, Robert Conquest, or Stephen Wheatcroft, conclude the same thing. Conquest holds that Stalin wanted the famine, and that the Ukrainian famine was deliberately inflicted for his own sake. What I argue is that with the resulting famine imminent, he could have prevented it but put Soviet interest other than feeding the starving first, thus consciously abetting it. Zero culpability in what happened is akin to denying Churchill had any culpability in the Bengal famine. There is certainly a difference between a colonial country imposing its will on a colonized populace and a centrally planned economy failing at fully implementing collectivization, but that doesn't make either good. The king appointed me prime minister of this country, and it's my duty to lead them through this war. The world and its economics are a multifaceted organism, and trying to apply a single theory of everything to capitalism will have a hard time proving to be useful. While the predatory global banking cabal certainly seems like a time-tested classic to explain all of the world's woes, it unfortunately limits the scope of your analysis. We're often left wanting when watching your numerous paid speaking engagements because we rarely hear the same fire and brimstone being applied to energy companies. After all, capitalism is a system in which you can buy and sell property and those with the largest collection of accrued capital will in turn have the most power to exert within society. 
The biggest existential threat facing humanity is climate change. It affects all living things on Earth, and unfortunately is something that requires global cooperation amongst both political leaders, but more importantly, amongst corporations. Now here's a list of the most powerful corporations on Earth. And of the top 10, six of them are energy companies. And yes, the IMF and the World Bank do pour money into developing nations with huge amounts of debt accumulation and work in a predatory manner, and that should be called out for what it is. In 1997, as a condition with the World Bank, the water in El Alto was privatized and connection fees were gradually increased to over $400 per household. That can all be true, while at the same time, you should also be aware of the following. International Kabbalah Bankers is a dog whistle for the Jewish question. It's, it's not only many dog whistles, it's a combination of dog whistles. International Kabbalah of Bankers. Bankers that are in an international cabal in bankers. Using usury in combination with them as a doggy festival. This would all be slightly less shocking if you hadn't also given a speech at a Nazwell conference. With the leading organizer of the National Bolshevik Party in Russia. Yeah. Alexander Dugin is not a conservative figure who you should disagree with on many key He's things. He's a Nazi with lefty aesthetics who again is a Nazi. And by the way, Thought Slime did a better job than we ever could in breaking apart trans ideologies, so why don't you stop listening to cis people and click on some other content creators in the description below. And don't listen to a fucking na- Conclusion, BreadTube is pretentious nonsense that is becoming less relevant by the day because the world is changing rapidly. Governments, powerful capitalist countries are showing that they don't care about the poor people, old people, black people, or indigenous people. I mean, we haven't done any videos on the U.S. coup attempts in Venezuela, and thereby the transitive property immediately support that we worship at the altar of Juan Guaido. So some amongst you might not think it's too becoming for two Canadian gentlemen to talk about what African countries should do in terms of accepting foreign investments. To that accusation, we say you're completely and utterly correct. There is absolutely no question that given the choice between taking Chinese investments and American ones, one deal looks strikingly better. One country is for giving unprecedented amounts of debt and developing incredible infrastructure in the country. China has increased investment in the continent 40-fold in the past two decades. China has expanded African railways, invested in various projects in Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Angola, and Nigeria. The main purpose behind China's investments are mineral extraction. Of the total $83 billion China has invested into Africa between 2005 and 2017, 40.3% was invested in minerals and 33.4% into energy, and a third of China's oil comes from Africa. President Xi Jinping stated, inadequate infrastructure is believed to be the biggest bottleneck to African development. China and Africa have become each other's largest trading partners. In the values that it promotes, in the manner that it operates, and in the impact that it has on African countries. FOCAC refutes the view that a new colonialism is taking hold in Africa, as our detractors would have us believe. China has also built a military base in Djibouti, as well as large manufacturing plants of consumer products that take advantage of the cheaper labor and work conditions. You know who else has military station there? In fact, the U.S. has at least 34 military bases scattered across Africa. Also France. Motherfucking France is still the largest player in the African continent. <laughs> and it's a history of not only setting up military bases, but the far more horrifying colonization and enslavement. To quote Lenin, if it were necessary to give the briefest possible definition of imperialism, we should have to say that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism. Such a definition would include what is most important for, on the other hand, finance capital is the bank capital, of a few very big monopolistic banks, merged with the capital of the monopolistic associations of industrialists, and on the other hand, the division of the world is the transition from a colonial policy, which has extended without hindrance to territories unseized by any capitalist power, to a colonial policy of monopolistic possession of the territory of the world which has been completely divided up. China has both state-owned and private banks, as well as state-owned and private corporations, which set up factories in foreign countries for the purposes of exploiting their labor and their resources. They're doing it better than other empires before them, but they're still doing it. And why wouldn't they? That's kind of the point. We disagree that Churchill was a horrifying monster, or that America has been an imperial overlord. Ascribing someone as good or evil is a privilege for those who are descendants of a time hopefully far crueler than the ones they inhabit. To the accusations that we don't understand history, well, on one hand, you're right.
don't 100% know and believe what you're saying, you don't say it. All that I 100% know about 9-11 is that there are some things about the official story of 9-11 that don't make sense. That's all I know. That's all I know. That is all I know. That's it. Um, and I can't say more than that. Right? I, I can't say the U.S. government did it because I don't know that. I can't say Israel did it because I don't know that. Come on, let's go on to be God, I'm Ra. We pray at your altar of awesomeness. To our monarch, Thomas Bone, you are the light that guides our path. To our lords, Jeffrey Lamb, Stephen, Nine Tails Cosmic Fox, Hans Josephine, and Poppy Nelson, we bow meekly for your pleasure. To our knights of the round table, Josh Mickelson, Dylan Byte, Alexander Thaler, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, Todd Lajeunesse, Clement Chutzkoff, God Bear Game, Moss Beast, Political Puppy, Ali Menthol, Jimmy Big Nuts, Alan R, Andreas Chitoro, Good Food Hates Cops, That Solid Food Man, and Bryn, we salute you. And to our many merchants and farmers, you have our undying love 